Hey guys, my name is Frank, and this is the Pothon Programming Video Log. Do you want to better understand the model view controller concept so you can write cleaner, more modular code? Then you're in the right place. Stay tuned. In this video, I'm going to explain MVC in terms of input, processing, and output, or IPO. Then I'm going to show a tiny example of IPO in action. If you have any comments or questions, you know where to put them. And if at any point you feel like you're learning something, please give this video a like. Also, be sure to check out the links to the working example and source code in the video description once the video is over. Today, I'm going to explain model view controller or MVC architecture in the simplest terms I can. When applied, the MVC concept can help you write modular and more maintainable code, thus saving you a lot of development time. Since MVC can be a bit complicated to grasp, I'll be explaining it in terms of IPO, or input, processing, and output. Don't worry, it's the exact same concept, just with less abstract terminology. First, I would like you to forget the acronym MVC and instead consider the acronym IPO, which stands for Input, Processing, and Output. IPO is a simple concept that outlines the three basic components of pretty much all common computer software. Think about it. Whether you're using a text editor, presentation software, or playing a game on your phone, the program is doing three things over and over again. First, it's taking user input via some sort of controller. Second, it's processing that input. And third, it's outputting a result to the screen for you to view. In this way, computers take our raw input, process it, and give us something useful or entertaining in return. Input, processing, and output are naturally separate components. Just think of a desktop computer setup. You have a keyboard, a motherboard, and a monitor. One controls input, one does the processing, and one displays the result to the user. They are totally separate and replaceable, yet they can interact via external ports and interfaces. Now let's apply this physical relationship between computer hardware components to our code with some object-oriented programming. First, you would create a class for each component and store it in a separate file, one to handle the application's user input, one to process that input, and one to handle displaying the result on screen. Each class would have public methods and interfaces allowing them to interact with each other, but none of them would ever have an internal reference to an instance of another component. That would be the hardware equivalent of hardwiring your keyboard to your computer. Not only is it harder to maintain, but now you can't use that keyboard with another computer. It hurts maintainability and modularity. Instead, keyboards have plugs and computers have ports. These interfaces allow us to mix and match devices as we please. In the same way, our classes should only interact via their public methods. Now that we have our classes, we can bring them together in the main application file. We can instantiate each one and have them communicate with their public methods. Whenever you want to edit a class, you can easily locate all of its inner workings in one file or at least in one big block of code. And if you make any major changes, it won't affect any of the other classes. The most you might have to do is rewrite some of the interactions between classes in the main file. Even if you prefer to have everything in one big file, you can still edit each class as you please without breaking the other classes, which is why this approach improves maintainability. Because you can totally remove or replace a class with relative ease, this approach is also great for modularity. So IPO is a concept that describes the basic model of how we interact with software. In comparison, MVC is the same concept with slightly more abstract terminology. Rather than input, processing, and output, you have controller, model, and view. By separating the different components into logical groups in your program, you can more easily maintain code that governs one component without having to refactor code in another component. In addition, by writing a self-contained class to manage each component, it makes code highly modular and more reusable. There are no strict standards when it comes to implementing IPO or MVC, but remember to follow object-oriented programming principles for the best results and always prefer component interaction via public methods over internal references. It helps a great deal to define your classes for each component in separate files and bring them all together in one main file where they will communicate with each other via their public methods. So now that I've talked about MVC and IPO a little bit, I'm going to show you guys this example that shows you kind of how to implement it. So this is going to use the IPO approach rather than MVC, but remember they're basically the same thing, just different terminologies. And this little application has the three different components separated out in its code into three different files and three different classes, the input, processor, and output classes. So what input takes care of is getting user input in the form of a click. So when I click on my browser window, it's going to change the background color of my application. Processing, 
The processing section is going to generate a random color and the output section is going to draw that color to the background of the screen. So from start to finish, we have input, we get a click, processing generates a random color, hands it to the output function or the output class and output draws that color to the screen. So pretty simple. Very simple, actually, and it's probably overkill to employ IPO or MVC on an application so simple. But for bigger applications, it's definitely useful. Anyway, you can still see how organization takes place when using this approach. Here's my main file, and as you can see, it's very, very small. Everything is very neat and orderly. I have my three different classes defined inside of my main JS file. I have my input, my processor, and my output. The input is going to take this update function and all that's going to do is have the output and processor components communicate with each other via their public methods, which are render color and get random color. And down here at the bottom, I'm adding that click event listener and I'm giving it the input dot handle click handler function to handle click events. Now, input is going to call this update function every time a click event is fired. So if I come into my input class, you can see that this is the handle click method. And inside of it, I'm just getting a reference to that update function and calling it. So I'm calling this update function that I've defined in my main JS file every time I click the screen. So every time I click this browser window, this update function is gonna be called. And what it's gonna do is generate a random color with the processor class, and then draw that color with the render color class. So let's take a look at the get random color function inside of the processor class. Here's the get random color function. Basically, all it does is gets a, a random color value between 0 and 16,777,215, which is basically the color value for white in decimal. Uh, you're probably more familiar with this value in hex, and that looks like FF, 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 just six Fs. Uh, the color value for black would just be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, which would be represented in decimal as 0. So that's all that does. It just gets a random color value between black and white, and it puts it into a hex string, which is then handed over to the output class and its render color method. So this is going to set whatever color we hand into it as the background color of whatever element we've handed it when we instantiated the output class. So if I come into my main file again, take a look at where I'm instantiating this output class, you can see I'm handing in document.body. If I were to hand in something different, say document.query selector p, or put that in quotes there, p, that's gonna get my p element instead of my background or my body element. Now when I click the screen, it's gonna change the background color of the P element instead of the body element. It's pretty simple. I'm gonna change it back to the way it was. Save and let's see here. All right, so anyway, that is basically my entire example. All it does is allow you to click the screen and change the background color of the browser window. And what IPO does in, or MVC, what that gives me is the ability to separate out all my code into these different files and into these different classes. And what that gives me is much more easy to maintain code. It also makes my code a lot more modular. For instance, I could take this input class and I can move it to a different application if I want very easily, specifically because it's in its own file, but also because it's its own self-contained class without any references to the other parts of my application. If I had references to the output or processor inside of this, that would make things a lot more complicated and it would prevent me from easily taking this class and moving it to another application. So basically IPO or MVC just gives you the ability to have much more easily maintained and modular code. So I hope you guys learned something from this video. I hope you enjoyed watching it. If you did learn something, give the video a like and definitely stay tuned for my next videos because they're gonna be on actual game design stuff rather than these abstract concepts. Anyway, thanks for watching and have a good one.